Good afternoon, everyone. We are back with another digital devotion. Um, we've been working our way through the Apostles' Creed one line at a time, um, and we are now finally here to begin the third article of the Creed. Um, you can kind of neatly divide up the Creed into three parts. Uh, the first is, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Um, so dealing with the Father. Um, the second article deals with Jesus, the Son. And then the third article um, begins with, I believe in the Holy Spirit. So we are here today to talk about what it is to believe in the Holy Spirit. But before we do that, uh, I was remiss. I left something out of my last digital devotion when we were talking about um, Jesus being crucified, dead, and buried. Or no, sorry, uh, that on the third day Jesus rose from the dead, but we were talking about um, the, the, the third day, meaning something happened in between the crucified and the rose from the dead. We were talking about how on Holy Saturday Jesus descended to the dead, descended to hell. Um, and there was something I forgot to mention in that, it, a, an important part of of why that is uh, a part of this this story we tell as Christians. Um, and it is this. In Jesus Christ, we find grace and mercy and love and forgiveness from God. Now, this is not something new that God does. It's not like God was vengeful until Jesus, and now after Jesus, God is merciful and forgiving. There is plenty of grace and mercy and forgiveness in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is itself a story of God keeping the promise uh, made to Abraham alive, even through uh, Israel's unfaithfulness. Um, so it's not like now that we have Jesus, we get a loving and forgiving God, but before Jesus, we had an um, angry and judgy God. Um, it's just that we find forgiveness as, as humanity through the work of Jesus Christ, through what God does in Jesus Christ between the cross and the empty tomb. Um, but it's easy to say that uh, because we are now under mercy, there is no longer judgment, right? Because God forgives our sins, um, that God's judgment upon sin is somehow removed which is not at all the case. A key feature in Jesus descending to the dead, a key feature in Jesus descending into hell, is that it tells us that the judgment of God still reigns. That there are things in this world to which God still says no. That God does not say no to us because we participate in those things. We hear God's yes through Jesus Christ. But there is still sin in the world, and God still says no to that. Paul talks about how God made, Je God made him, who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us. And so, in going to hell, the judgment of God against sin persists. But it just doesn't have the last word. It doesn't have the last word for Jesus, and it doesn't have the last word for us. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. But before we leave God's no, we, we do need to say that we have seen recently things to which God says no. That if we, if we think about the promises God makes to us of, of what heaven will be like, of what the fullness of the kingdom of God will be like, we can see in that God's no. And, and it's important for Christians, when they look at where we are in the world right now, to be able to say, there are parts about this God says no to. God says no to disease. God says no to pandemic. God says no to racism. God says no to murder. God says no to, to disordered relationships and disharmony. God says no to all of that. God 
sends all of that to hell in Jesus Christ. But, as we have seen, the fullness of God's rejection of sin, both personal and communal, has yet to be realized in time in this world. Herein comes the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed uh, elaborates a little bit more on the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, beyond just, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed continues uh, or says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. So if you've noticed, uh, there's, there's kind of this... Um, this way in which the creed ascribes deity to the different persons of the Trinity. I believe in God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Um, the, the Old Testament talks about God the Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being Lord time and time again. Uh, and if you open your Bibles, um, oftentimes you'll see Lord in small caps. Um, and what that is, is it's, uh, it's, it's how certain translations render the proper name of God, uh, that God gives to Moses. Um, it's how the text renders the word Yahweh. Um, and so what the creed will do is it will say, Jesus Christ is only son, our Lord. And that Lord is meant to to show that, that Jesus somehow participates in the being of Yahweh. And so when the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, what it's doing is saying the Holy Spirit participates in the being of, of, of Yahweh, that, that this God, this Lord, exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit is God. But the next, the next phrase, uh, I think, is important. The giver of life. You see, on Holy Saturday, Jesus descended to the dead. God and Jesus Christ descended to the dead. It wasn't the human part of Jesus that died while the divine part lived on somewhere else. Because we can't separate Jesus' humanity and his divinity. So Jesus, in his fullness as man, human and fullness as God, descends into the realm of the dead, descends into hell. And in so doing, God proclaims God's judgment upon all sin and banishes all sin to hell with Jesus. But then the Lord the giver of life comes in. And it is that work of the Holy Spirit that raises Jesus Christ on the third day. But it is an interesting thing because the Holy Spirit was not done on Easter. But instead, the Holy Spirit is given to humanity and continues to be at work in our world. I'm reaching for a book. And you might guess it, it's Karl Barth. Uh, Karl Barth will talk about the Holy Spirit being the power of God at work in the world. And that is what there it is, the work of God on earth, which has its analog in that hidden work of God, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit continues to be at work in our world, and here's what I think the Holy Spirit is doing in our world. The main work of the Holy Spirit in our world. You see, God continues to say no to sin. God continues to... to to, 
to unleash God's judgment upon sin. God continues to banish sin to hell. But the Spirit comes to give life. Right? The Spirit comes to give life to us, to, to our spirits, so that when... Uh, when we die with Jesus Christ, when we participate in his death so that the sin that lives in us might die, might be banished, it is the Holy Spirit that comes and gives us new birth so that we might participate in Jesus' resurrection. That's one of the images for baptism. Um, you, we especially think of it when we think of immersion baptism. That you come down into the water and you are fully submerged in the water. And that when you go into the water, you die. You, particip you die with Jesus. You participate in his death. That coming out of the water, you might participate in his resurrection. But it is the Holy Spirit that brings that new life. It is the Holy Spirit that is the spark of that resurrection. So, the judgment and the mercy of God are one in the same. The judgment and the grace of God are one in the same. God judges us so that we might be raised to new life, and within that new life we might have freedom. Paul talks about how we, it is... It, uh, that when we die with Christ, we are raised and we have and we receive a spirit of freedom. Um, but for Paul, freedom isn't the ability to choose to go one way or the other. That isn't what freedom means for Paul. It isn't saying, I could do this bad thing or I could do this good thing. Or I could eat a turkey sandwich or I could eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. No, for Paul, freedom means the ability to do the will of God. It means the ability to say yes to God. Because the way Paul talks about it, that prior to being crucified with Christ, we have no ability to say yes to God. That sin has so clouded us that, that we aren't free, we are slaves to sin. And as slaves to sin, we can do nothing but participate in sin. So that when we are raised to life, we have the freedom... To say yes to God. But it's not, it, it is a freedom for. Um, it is a freedom for God. Because to then say no to God would be to enslave ourselves back in sin. So it's not exercising our freedom to say no to God. It is resuming our slaves to sin state. So the only, the only expression of our freedom is in saying yes to God. But it is precisely this freedom that the Spirit comes to give us. Freedom to follow God, freedom to love God, freedom to respond to God in the world. It's a freedom to, to look at evils in our world and say, I will not be a part of that anymore. I will resist it. I will work against injustice. I will name racism for what it is. I will name greed for what it is. I will work against a system that leaves thousands homeless, thousands hungry. That I will work for things that we, that we know that God is doing in the world. I will participate in the work of God in the world. And see, that is what it is to be free. To participate in what God is doing in the world. And we do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Karl Barth says, Christians are those breathed upon by Christ. Therefore, we can never in one respect speak soberly enough of the Holy Spirit. What is involved is the participation of man in the word and work of Christ. But this simple thing is at the same time something supremely inconceivable. For this participation of man means active participation. It means we get to do something. It means we have a job to do. The entire life of a Christian is lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is made possible by the Holy Spirit 
and is sustained by the Holy Spirit. We as, as Christians live under the shade of the Holy Spirit. I said that you could uh, organize the three, you could organize the creed into, into three areas. When he starts talking about the Holy Spirit, that's what Karl Barth does. He said that in the first article, we are talking about God. In the second article, we are talking about the God-man. We are talking about Jesus. He says the third article talks about humanity. It talks about us. Which is weird in a sense because it begins with, I believe in the Holy Spirit. So we would think that the third article is about the Holy Spirit and the works that the Holy Spirit does in the world through the church. But in reality, you can't talk about the work of the Holy Spirit through the church without talking about humanity. And so in the, in the third article of the creed, we hear our call to arms. That we are to believe in the Holy Spirit, we are to participate in the work of God in the world through the Holy Spirit. But before we go, I do want to say um, a little bit that might potentially be abstract about how the Holy Spirit works. Because I think, you know, it's, um, we can understand God generally. We can easily conceive of Jesus Christ. Um, the Holy Spirit, it can... It can become trickier to talk about who the Holy Spirit is in herself. What is the Holy Spirit? I remember when I was writing my papers for commissioning and ordination, um, it was easy for me to talk about who God is in God's self, um, talk about how God is Trinity, talk about God being omnipotent, omniscient, all of these things. Easy to talk about Jesus, easy to talk about humanity and our need for grace, easy to talk about the mechanisms of our salvation. Then we got to, what is the Holy Spirit? And I stared at a blinking cursor for a long time. Usually we talk about the Holy Spirit through the works of the Holy Spirit, through what the Holy Spirit enables in the church and human beings. But we don't always talk about the Holy Spirit in herself. Hans Urs von Balthasar, um, my favorite name to say, um, picks up this, this kind of Eastern idea um, about how the, the Trinity works. Uh, and it's this notion that the Holy Spirit is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. Um, and that the Holy Spirit, so the, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed will talk about how the Holy Spirit uh, proceeds from the Father and the Son. Um, that's, I, I'm not sure if we've talked about that there was this big divide between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. The Eastern Church said, no, Holy Spirit only proceeds from the Father. The Western Church says, no, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And that's one of the reasons that the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Holy Catholic Church broke away from one another. Um, but what von Balthasar will, will, will talk about is that um, we can conceive of the Holy Spirit um, being generated as the Father and the Son to turn toward one another. It's this, uh, he uses the word spiration. And, and, and it's cool because you can see the, the Father and the Son uh, turning towards one another and that the love that is generated in that moment is what the whole is how the Holy Spirit is brought forth. That you can't have, uh, that you couldn't have the, if it just went one way, from the Father to the Son, that it wouldn't be that it wouldn't be enough because God love the the persons of the Trinity love each other perfectly. And so in freedom, the Father loves the Son. And the Son returns the Father's love back to Him. But also in freedom, the Son loves the Father. And so the Holy Spirit becomes this bond that links the, the Trinity together. That it is the source 
uh, that it is the how the father and the son radiate love back and forth between them. And that we, we're early on, we talked about how von Balthasar characterized that the, 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 this mission of salvation, this work of salvation, as being this expression of inner Trinitarian love. That the Father seeks to glorify the Son, that the Son seeks to deliver this gift, this gift, uh, the, a redeemed creation back to the Father. That all of this is an outpouring, that it's, it's an outward expression of the love of, that God has within God's self. But that is the Holy Spirit. So, we think about the Holy Spirit as being predominantly this thing that, that moves and alights within the church, but it's also, I mean, it's the ground in which we stand. It is the air we breathe. Were it not for the Holy Spirit, creation, life, redemption, salvation, none of it's possible. In the church, we rightly praise God. We rightly praise Jesus. But I think sometimes we can forget that the Holy Spirit is the one doing all the legwork in this. It's the Holy Spirit that is that, that love radiating from God. That is the Holy Spirit that catches us up within this act and work of God. So may you this week see the Holy Spirit at work in the world, bringing life, bringing light to the places where God is still moving and God is still working. May you see the Holy Spirit as folks in our community care for one another, donating food, May you see the Holy Spirit as you worship God, as you feel God's presence, as you're made aware of God's love for you. May you see the Holy Spirit at work when we worship on Sunday morning. Part of what we're going to be doing on Sunday morning is the love feast. Um, it is an ancient ritual of the church um, in which through the sharing of, of food, through the sharing of uh, a meal, we are connected to, uh, so we are reminded of the meals that Jesus shared with his disciples, and we are connected to this unique form of community that we find in the church. Um, and my hope and my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will in some ways connect us to one another, maybe in a way that we haven't felt in a little while, because we haven't been able to physically be together. That through the sharing of food, there might be this spiritual connection. As a, as a brief reminder, um, I am asking that you uh, prepare something, that you, that you make something for this love feast. Um, yesterday, I made some uh, cinnamon sugar pound coffee cake loaf um, and it made my house smell really good. Um, and so I will have that ready for Sunday morning, but I'm asking that, that you do the same, that, um, through that shared labor and through the sharing of, of that meal with, the, with each other, um, we might feel some sort of, of spiritual and emotional connection, um, uh, as we won't be able to be physically present to one another before it's my time to, to transition away from spirit and life. Um, but we will leave discussion of the Holy Spirit here for now. To meditate on, to ponder how much we are dependent on the Spirit for everything. Pastor Mario will be back on Friday to continue our journey through the third article of the Creed. Um, and we will be together, I hope, 
on Sunday morning for online worship. Uh, I hope you all are having a great day, great week, that you are staying healthy and staying safe. God bless.